as we venture into this thought today, that God will speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to preach you a message this morning that God's given me entitled, What's Love Got to Do With It? What's Love Got to Do With It? I'm sure many of you are probably reflecting over the, the title of this and know where I've taken that from. Tina Turner used to sing a song, What's Love Got to Do With It? I don't think Ike understood the meaning of that song, but <laughs> Tina was singing about it, and, uh, and I thought as I was preparing this message here, it would be fitting for uh, the idea in which God is instructed in my heart. What's love got to do with it? I want you to think about this with me for just a few moments on how does God love us? On how does God love us? I want you to think, if you will, about how God loves us. I want you to look at verse number, uh, uh, John chapter number 15, verse number 12 through 13. And the Bible says this here. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. As the Bible was instructing us here, as John was writing down these words, as he was given an inspiration by the Holy Spirit to instruct us about the, the definition of love, he wanted us to understand that Jesus is the greatest love that we could have ever experienced. He told us, he said, this is a commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Boy, I say, that's a tall measure to be able to reach up to. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute, about how that Jesus loved us. He loved us so much that he died for our sins and Yet the Bible's telling us in John that we're supposed to love one another as Jesus also loved us. How is it, my friends, that we can do what God has asked us to do? He told us that a greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. In other words, a great sacrifice that is made was made by Jesus for you and I. It was an example. He said, that's the depth of love in which I want you to be able to experience in your life. I want you to think about God's love and how he loves us sacrificially. Think about how Jesus loved us sacrificially. When Jesus made that statement, the law of revenge and retaliation among that region was running rampant. Meaning that people were always trying to get back at someone or either they would retaliate for their wrongdoings with a swift sword or it could be that they would destroy somebody's character. And I think to myself today, it's not far from that mentality back then that we live in today. The world's full of people who care to assassinate one another and they try to destroy people's lives and it's not a definition of love. But I want you to know something here that Jesus gave us a picture of what love really is and he expects for us to meet up to his expectations. See, I want you to think about that we are encouraged to pay people back uh, with love and not pain and suffering. We are commanded, as a matter of fact, to love our neighbors to make sure that we are demonstrating uh, uh, the attribute of love in a way that is life-changing and life-giving. Keep in mind that Jesus did just that for you and I. Keep in mind that when he sacrificed himself on that cross, and I will say this until he takes us home, that nobody killed Jesus. Jesus willingly stretched out on that cross for you and I, and he did it sacrificially because he loved us greatly he demonstrated his love love is just a word until you put action to it you can say that you love somebody but until you demonstrate that love toward them then it may just be words i want you to know something here this morning that jesus demonstrated his love toward us when he died on that cross for our sins 
John records these words of Jesus to show that this idea of loving others by sacrificing oneself was not a philosophical idea in that particular day. Let me remind you that Jesus actually did this and he died on the cross for our sins. So he was living out what it is he said for us to do in these verses. Now, I don't mean that Jesus wants us to, to give our life up. What I do know is that Jesus wants us to sacrifice deeply for our brothers and sisters. I'll go as far as to say this here. Not only our brothers and sisters, they should be, that should not even be a question as to where and how we love our neighbor as our brothers and sisters. But Jesus also wants us to love our enemies. Oh, preacher, you don't know my enemies. Let me just say this here. An enemy is an enemy. People who hate you and despise you are just like the next person who hates somebody else and despises them. But Jesus said it doesn't matter because he was hated and despised and, 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 and put on a cross and, and died by people who despised him and hated him. But Jesus loved them anyway. I'm going to go as far as to say this here. Before God saved you, your sins were the very reason that he was on the cross. So you and I are responsible for him having to come and die on that cross. I'm grateful for what he did. He showed us a sacrificial love. And it was not only did he show us a sacrificial love, but it was an unselfish love that he demonstrated toward us. See, the standard of today is for us to think about ourselves and our think about ourselves first. Unselfish love does not ask what it is that you can do for me, but rather, how can I serve you? See, Jesus did what he did, and he was unselfish with his actions. He didn't do it so he could receive something, but he did it so that we could receive something. That we could receive the forgiveness of sin and the, and the pardon from the penalty of eternal death and hell. He did it for you and I so that we could have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus sacrificed himself on the cross and he did it unselfishly so that we could live for eternity with him. What an easy task. It took great it took a, a great discipline for him to do what he did. I want to remind you, he was 100% God as well as he was 100% man. I can assure you that the 100% man wanted off that cross. But the 100% God said, you got to stay. You're talking about great discipline. We're talking about a, a Jesus who could have called legions of angels from heaven and just took himself off of that cross and destroyed all that stood before him. But he chose not to do that. He was unselfish with his actions. I, I want you to understand something here. He was laying before us an example. See, unselfish love is ready to endure hardship, encourage those who are in danger, and practice self-denial for others. Even if love is not returned, unselfish love does not quit. See, Jesus, as though he, he demonstrated unselfish love, he did not quit on us. People are quitting on each other all around us today. People are giving up, every, I mean, at the very sign of hardship and trouble. People will back up and bow out and repunt and go find somebody else, somewhere else to play. You, you understand what I'm saying this morning? Jesus didn't do that. Jesus stuck with the task. Jesus saw that there was a need and Jesus fulfilled his obligation of dying for us and he did it unselfishly. Let me say this here. Love should never be dependent upon what someone else can do for you. If it is, it's really not true love. I heard a story one time. It says Terry received a letter. From his former fiance. And the letter, the letter read like this. Terry, no words could ever express the great unhappiness I have felt since breaking off our engagement. Please say that you're going to take me back. No one could have ever taken your place in my heart. So please forgive me. I love you. I love you. I love you. Forever yours, Marie. P.S. Congratulations on winning the state lottery. 
You see, the world's full of people that will love you if they can get something back. See, God did not, he did not need anything from us. And really, there was nothing we could give him of substantial value. What Jesus done on the cross, he did because he loved us. He did it from pure motives and pure holiness and pure righteousness. That's what he did for you and I when he died on that cross. He didn't expect anything back except for us to say, Lord, forgive me, I'm a sinner. Lord, come into my heart and redeem me from my sins because I can't make it without you. Oh, all he wanted was a relationship with us. You see, the world, they put a price tag on love. They, they, they say, I'll love you if you can do this. Or I will respond to your love if I can get something out of it. Can I tell you true, unadulterated love is a love that has pure motives and is not expecting something in return. And that's what Jesus done for us. You ought to shout this morning. Just knowing that God didn't require you to have to pay some uh, hefty uh, fee or something in order for you to be born again. But rather, he said it is a free gift of salvation. Oh, hallelujah. I know that he loved us. You know that he loves us. But we have to be reminded of that sometimes. Second thing I want you to think about is why should we love like God? Why should we love like God? Won't you look at verse number 34, John chapter 13, verse number 34. Here's what the Bible says. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. See, Christians have this notion that God's commandments are somehow, uh, you know, up for debate. I mean, it's just the truth of it. You know, Christians oftentimes say, you know what? I don't like that one right there. We're going to skip over that commandment. We're going to go on to the next one. Lord, I'm all in on these other ones, but that one right there, I, I, can't, I can't do it, Lord. See, it's not open for debate. God's commandments are God's commandments, and he wants us to, to make sure that we live in those commandments because when he sets forth a rule and a law for us to live by, it is for his glory and for our benefit. You see, when we fail to love our neighbors the way God told us to love our neighbors, when we fail to do that, we put ourselves in bondage. Oh, hallelujah. Here's what I've learned over the years. I've learned this, that sometimes when we fail to love those that, that have wronged us, they don't even think a thing about it, but we're held hostage to that, that event. The Bible tells us to love our neighbors. He told us to love one another. He told us that it is, it is a commandment. He made it a fundamental law for his kingdom that we love one another. See, laws were never meant to be broken. Ne they were never meant to be neglected. But that's what's happening today in Christians. Christians are picking and choosing. They're cherry picking what they want to live by and telling God the rest of it's not relevant for me. And I want you to understand something this morning. It's all relevant. God expects us to do what he says to do. Here's what I've learned over the years. I've learned that from a father's relationship and, and, and a child relationship, when that child does what daddy says to do, the child benefits. You get some good grades and we'll do something for you. You go cut the grass and I'll take care of one of your needs that you want or one of your wants. You do this or you do that. I, you know, if you will do what I've asked you to do, I'm asking you to do it out of love because I want to love you back and give you something. Here's what God does. Whenever we fulfill the laws and the commandments that he gives us, here's what he does. He dumps the honey bucket on us. Oh, I don't know about y'all, but I like, I like honey. I like the honey bucket all over me. I like it when God just gets, lets me get in the glory. God never intended for me to be one who picks and chooses what he says to do. And Tatlot said this here. Here's the paradox. We can fully embrace God's love only when we recognize how completely and unworthy of it we are. And Tatlock said this here. She said that we will never truly understand the depth of God's love until we fully embrace and, and, and allow ourselves to understand that we are unworthy of, the, of God's love and, and that we, we don't deserve it. 
I want you to know something here that the Bible tells us in 1 John chapter number 4 and verse number 19. It says, we love him because he first loved us. You want to know why that we can love God? It's because he's demonstrated that love toward us. He's shown us an example of what love really looks like. Therefore, in turn, we can love him back. C.S. Lewis said this, Though our feelings come and go, God's love for us does not. Can I tell you this morning that sometimes we forget how to love God. We forget how to love our neighbors. We need a refresher course from time to time. We need to step back and say, God birthed in my spirit again what it means to love my neighbors. The love of God is not contingent upon interactions or emotional responses, but rather the love of God is contingent upon how, what we know God has done for us. We should in turn want to love our neighbors like he's loved us. If we can deeply appreciate the love of God in our own life, then we can, uh, we can bestow that love upon somebody else so that they'll know that they're loved by Jesus too. Amen. Until you find out that God really loves you, until you explore the depth of God's love in your own life, you'll never be able to love your neighbor the way God told you to love them. I'm going to say that again because some of you are looking at me just kind of crazy. Until you understand the depth of how God loves you, you'll never be able to love your neighbor the way God instructed you to do it. It's just not possible. And I want you to think about, if you will, I want you to think about how that John, in chapter number 13, verse 12 through 15, we don't pull the scripture up. I want you to think about he set an example of a, uh, of a selfless love by washing the disciples' feet. He even washed the feet of Judas, who would eventually betray him and lead those Roman soldiers to find him and arrest him. See, the type of love God empowers us to share shows us how to love even people who won't love you back. I want you to think about this with me. It's easy to love people who love you back. It's difficult to love people who don't want nothing to do with you. Preacher, how do I do it? You do it with God's love. Amen. I'm going to say this within myself. I'm not capable of loving my enemies. I'm not. I'm not capable of loving people who don't, who don't invest in me unless, unless God does it through me. Outside of Jesus, I'm desperately wicked. Hey, you are too. Outside of Jesus, we are desperately wicked. Outside of Jesus, I care nothing about people. But inside of Christ and the Christ who lives in me and through me and around me and about me teaches me how to love my neighbors. I'm going to be, just gonna be up front and honest about something here since we're just being honest this morning. I just want to be upfront and honest with you this morning. When we go out and we try to minister to people, and you go out maybe to the homeless, I don't want to be around those folks sometimes. Can I just be honest with you? Me within myself don't want to be a part of that. But Jesus in me says, yes, you do. Jesus within me says, you need to hug that guy's neck. Jesus in me says, you need to feed this one here. Jesus within me says, you need to clothe that one. Jesus within me says, you need to do whatever you need to do to show them that I love them. But the Rick don't want it. But the Jesus in me does. I want you to know something. Hey, don't look at me like that. You're the same way I am. Hey, we're desperately wicked outside of Christ. Just keep that in mind. But us within ourselves don't want to love our neighbors. But Jesus who is in us wants us to. It is a commandment. It is not a suggestion. Third thing I want you to think about is this. What is the results of reflecting God's love? What are the results of re reflecting God's love? When we love our neighbors, what we are in, uh, essentially doing is doing this. We're, we're saying, you know what? There's hope for you. There's hope for us all. And that love, when we reflect God's love, what it does, it, it, it paints a picture of grace to people who are hurting and who are broken. It shows our neighbors and those who are lost and undone without God that everybody's not a heathen. Somebody help me right there. 
It teaches those that are, that, that are in desperate need of, of, of salvation that they too can have a relationship with the holiness of God. I want you to tell, you to tell you something else that it does. Here's what else it does. When I reflect the love of God, it teaches me how to be a better man. It teaches me how to love God back because when I love my neighbors, I'm essentially loving God back. Hey, when I love those who despise me and hate me, that's what I'm saying. I'm loving God back by loving them. You see, Jesus loves them. Why can't I? Jesus cared for them. Why should I not? If I have hatred toward another person, it's an indictment that I am not a true disciple of Jesus Christ. Did you hear what I said? When I have hatred towards somebody else, it is an indictment that I, I am not a true disciple of Jesus Christ because uh, uh, Christ's disciples were lovers of people. See, it's impossible to love our neighbors effectively in the way that Christ commanded us to when we have hatred toward another. See, the hatred that we're talking about is the root of evil. It is the opposite of love. See, the enemies of our love relationship is ourself. You see, the enemy of our love relationship with God and with our neighbor is ourself. I'm the one that don't want to love my neighbor. You are the one that don't want to love your neighbor. It is our sinful nature that doesn't want to love those that are around us. I want to remind you of something here. When we live within our own means, with our own abilities, we will neglect those who are in need. But when we live within the Spirit of God and let the Spirit of God live through us and in us, we will help those and love those who are in need. Let me tell you something, folks. There is a, there is a, real, there is a real reflection of what love looks like, and that love is the image of Christ in our life. Let me say this here. Our relationship with people and how we love them affect our worship. Our relationship with people and how we love them affects our worship. I want you to look at Matthew chapter number 5, verse number 23. The Bible says this, Therefore, if you bring your gift to an altar, to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way, First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. If I have a problem with a brother or a sister, if I don't get that right, God ain't listening to nothing i got to say. You can stand up here all day you want, raise your hands and shout victory, but if you got an alt with your brother or your sister, God ain't listening to nothing you said. Because your offering that you're bringing toward him is not accepted until we get those things right. God wants us to love people. You say, preacher, I don't have an alt with my brother or sister, but do you have an alt with someone? It could be that you have an alt with somebody at work. Say, preacher, if I go up and, and try to fix this, it ain't going to go well. You do your part. That's all that matters. The rest of it's up to them. Amen. Preacher, I've got an alt with a, with a family member, and it's, it's been a long-standing feud over the years. We just don't even talk anymore. It's so bad. You need to fix that. Because you can't stand up here and praise God until it is fixed. Amen. I want you to understand something. You might be here today and have a wayward child. And man, I tell you what, the things that they've done over the years has just absolutely destroyed you until you get that thing right. Amen. Ain't going to help you. you. Might as well leave your gifts at the altar. You can stand up and praise him all you want. You can go on mission trips. You can study your Bibles. You can do whatever you want. But I'm telling you, until that alt is fixed, until we love people, even love our neighbors, love our family, love our friends, love our enemies, until we get that thing straightened out, it does not matter what you're doing in church by lifting your hands. God's not hearing that. He's not hearing it. Say, preacher, I want us to make sure we're loving our neighbors. If I'm passionate about my church and got an alt with my brother, it don't much matter. I'm not glorifying God. If I sing in a choir, if I sing on a stage, if I play an instrument and I'm not loving my neighbor, it don't matter. God's not accepting that offering. 
if I share my testimony and invite unchurched people to church, but I don't love them, if I don't, you know, correct the love issues that I got in my life, it don't much matter. God's not accepting my offering. I'm not saying God won't be glorified in some way through those things, but I'm saying this here. You personally are lacking in your relationship with God if you can't love your neighbor. We've got to love our neighbor. Here's what the Bible said in 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. He said this here, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not uh, parade itself. It is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But where there is prophecy, they will fail. Where there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. You know what Paul said in those verses of Scripture? He said the kind of love that we are responsible for is a love that is not put on display to be showed up or showed out uh, um, uh, so that people can see it, but rather it is a love that is pure and holy and undefiled, and it helps people, and it brings people to the, uh, to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And he said that type of love will never fail. Folks, I want you to know something as we bring this to a conclusion. I want you to think about this here. Jesus loved us without ever requiring us anything except for us to give our hearts to him. He never asked us to pay our way into heaven. He never said, work your way there. It's a free gift of salvation. He demonstrated that love on a cross. He put actions to the words that he spoke. He laid himself down on that cross. They nailed him to the tree. He was hung up there, and he died on that cross. But that's not where the story ends. Here's where the story continues. He was resurrected on that third day. Ascended back to, to, to the heavens. And there today, he is our mediator, our intercessor between us and, and God. I want you to tell you, I'm going to tell you what Jesus done. He's shown himself to be a lover of people. Then in turn, he says, if I do that, then all I expect you to do is to love your neighbor. Because if you can't love your neighbor, how are you going to love God? If you can't love those who you have seen, how can you love God who you have not seen? We don't know how to love one another. We're missing a great benefit that God has given us, and that's a relationship with him. Because our relationships are hindered. Say, preacher, how do I fix this? Well, first and foremost, if you got an alt with your brother, you got to fix it. You got to go to him. You got an alt with your sister, you need to go to him. If there's somebody that you work with, it might be a neighbor. I don't know it. Whoever it is, you got to fix that so that your worship is not hindered. When you do those things, you reflect the image of Christ, and people see that even if you might have been wronged in some way, people will see that this God who lives in you. Is greater than your struggles. And then they're going to know how to, how to get in on this thing. See, folks, we've got to love one another. Because when we love each other, we are loving.